Sai. Sai. Sai, wake up. Open those eyes wide. There's work ahead. Oh. I knew there was a catch in your gesture of affection. An emergency operation. Mr. Alfredo Hernandez. So, you don't mind if I call him Al for short? Are you assisting me? No, Sully is. Well, the operation's a flop from the start. How about a little kiss? The man is dying. So am I. See you later? Not tonight. Why not? I saw you last night. Well, so did I. What's the idea? You're giving me the air? Oh, don't be silly. Come on now, you better hurry. All right, I'll hurry. You know oh. I'm on duty tonight. Now, this case is serious. No fooling. All right, honey, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll give Alfredo the full benefit of modern science pronto. Savvy? Mm -hmm. How about seeing you later? I said no. Then I don't operate on Alfredo. An operation won't be necessary if you wait much longer. Sure, I'll see you. Mr. Hernandez is being prepared for the operating room now. Did you say Hernandez? Uh, 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 your name Hernandez? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, are you relatives of his? She, my wife. He, her, her father. Well, he's a very, very sick man. Um, could I uh, see you a moment? Uh, you don't mind it. Uh, your given name, please. Magnolia. <laughs> Did you tell Dr. Branton to come right up? Yes, I did, Doctor. Thanks. Well, when he comes, I want to see him alone. Would you mind leaving now, please? Certainly, Doctor. How's waiting for you? I know. Hi, then. Come in. Hello, Doctor. Hi, Doctor. Brenton, how long have you been on the staff here? Seven years. I've been here going on five years. The superintendent who preceded me pointed to you with pride. You were already an old-timer. You had an excellent reputation even then, both for your integrity and your ability. I want to have a little talk with you. Come in here. Is this the doctor? Yes. All right. Wait in there. Manuela, Manuela, don't, don't cry. You see that little red building out there? There's a mall. Yes. There's a person out there pointing his finger at you. Me? What do you mean? Brenton, I could send you to the penitentiary. This is a free institution. And you have been obtaining money here under misrepresentation of the worst kind. Unethical to the code of your profession is putting it mildly. I've checked up on you quite thoroughly, and I know from A to Z the graft you're pulling. I know that you have told unfortunate people that a little money paid you would procure for them individual skill, pure drugs, good food, and a guarantee of rapid recovery. Those poor people that just came in here went to the morgue and asked for their $50 back. Brenton, how can you be so devoid of decency and honor? How can you take fifty dollars? Fifty lousy dollars! Why, they should jingle in your conscience as long as you live. You knew all the time that man couldn't live. Why, you performed the operation on him yourself. Brenton, that man's blood must have been on your hands when you took that money. Were I to turn this and other evidence I have against you over to the authorities, you would be ruined for life. They take your license away from you and put you in jail. Georgia. Something's wrong. Why? Your boyfriend's up on the carpet. He is? Yeah, he's up there right now. Now, don't say I told you. I won't. You have a good eye for diagnosis and an unusual skill with your instruments, qualities that mankind is in sore need of. So I'm going to do something that perhaps someday I will regret. I don't know. But I'm going to give you 24 hours to get out of town. 
You're going to pay that $50 back. I never want to see your face again. I suggest that you go somewhere and start anew, combining honesty with industry. That's all. I have to do. Why don't you come along? How can I? But it's important that I see you at the apartment this evening. But you know I'm on duty I until morning. You slip away for a little while anyway. Then there is something else. No, I, I can't tell you now. You go to the apartment this evening and I know. don't ask me any more questions. <clears throat> All right, nurse. Thank you. <laughs> well, what do you have? Well, what have you got? Whiskey? Whiskey and whiskey. I'll have whiskey. Good. What's all the shooting about, sir? Yeah, what's coming off here? Well, boys, I'm leaving town. It's fate. My dear old Uncle Joe kicked off, leaving me the better part of a cool quarter of a million. I was at the phone of his death this morning. He died of a heart attack, superinduced by uh, indigestion. You know, the Brentons were all heart eaters. They're holding up the funeral until uh, the little heir, Cy, gets there. But what do you say we, uh, we drink to dear old Uncle Joe and his remarkable memory? Uncle Joe? What's the lowdown, Si? Nothing, just leaving Bronx General, that's all. Well, what are you going to do now? Oh, going to practice somewhere else? <clears throat> What's the real lowdown, Si? Well, they got me, that's all. Hospital? Old Howe, 10 detective. I guess it's all up. What are you going to do? Go to Chicago and start over again. I sure would like to go along. What would you do with your own patient? Well, he'll probably die anyway. Listen, J.B., I'll do the missionary work. If there's anything doing, I'll send for you. How about the dough? Got enough? Well, I have some. I wasn't in that racket for nothing. I haven't got what I should have, but I've got enough to give me a start. General practice? Sure, then I can do everything. How about Georgie? Well, she knows that I'm going, that's all. I don't want you to slip her anything I've told you. You're telling me to do I that? I know now? your next line. You'd have been in jail a long time ago if you hadn't learned to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> I want you boys to clear out of here. I'm expecting George up in a few minutes. How about a little drink for the handshake? Well, you can sweeten mine. No, thanks. That's mm -hmm. a good idea. I think I'll try it myself. Well, John, keep the home fires burning. Look after the women while I'm gone. Follow in your footsteps? Mm -hmm. Come on, Parker. Uh, goodbye, J.B. If anything happens, I'll let you know. All right, now take care of yourself, You bet I will. Goodbye, John. And uh, drop us a line once in a while. Don't forget, you know. It's all right. I'm depending on you okay, now. Okay, goodbye, John. So glad you came, honey. Take off your coat and sit down. Oh, no, I can't. I broke away from the hospital without telling anyone. Just hope they won't miss me. Yes, but you can take your coat off and stay a while. You're making it just that much tougher for me to leave, honey. <laughs> now, 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 you mustn't cry. <laughs> well, I don't see why you have to go if what you say is true. Well, you don't doubt me, do you? No, but... If there's nothing to it, as you say, why not stay here and fight it out? Because a change will do me good. Oh, I know, now, Simon. let's not rehash all that, dear. You know, I should have left the Bronx General a long time ago. There's nothing they can teach me. I've learned all they had to offer. I've taught them a few things, too. And don't you worry, honey. I'll send for you as soon as I get located. <sighs>
Has the job for the boy been filled yet, Doc? No. How old are you? Jeff. Oh, a comic. No, sir. Uh, here's some letters of recommendation from a few of the jobs I've had, Doc. A few of the jobs? I see. Did you write these yourself? No, sir. The reason I'd like to get this job, Doc, is because it would give me prestige. Well, when do I start? You can start right away. But you'll have to wear a uniform in this job. Yeah? Mm hmm Who buys it? I buy it, but you take care of it. That's okay. Well, is there anything I can start doing now, Doc? Yes. You can start calling me doctor instead of doc. Yes, doctor. Now, make yourself at home here, Jimmy. Clean up any rubbish you find hanging around, and uh, there'll be some people here for me. I've put an ad in the paper for a receptionist. A what? A receptionist. A stenographer. Oh. Now keep them waiting till I get back. Yes, sir. All those dames are outside for the stenographer's job, Doc. Uh, I know. The job's been filled. When? I said the job's been filled to everyone except the girl on the end of the bench. The doctor says the job has been filled. I just... Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, well, let's get some You dropped your handkerchief. Well, that's not mine. I know. The doctor wants to see you. Oh. This way, please. How do you do? How do you, you do? Uh, you came and answered my advertisement, I saw. Yes. What is your name? My name is Elsie Fryer. How experienced are you? Oh, very, Doctor. I can operate both a royal and an underwood. I have a smattering of double bookkeeping. I know how to answer a telephone. I'm 24. I smoke, drink. I don't live with my parents. I'm single and I'm not in love. I believe this is yours. You do? <clears throat> Have you ever worked for a doctor before? No, but I've had my share of contacts with doctors. One does get aches and pains sometimes. You think you'll enjoy working for a physician? Why, it shouldn't be difficult and I need the work. <sighs> well, you can start tomorrow. Thank you, doctor. Goodbye, Miss Fryer. About 10 o'clock in the morning? Yes. Not a bad way of day's work, Doctor. That'll be about all from you. Don't ever touch these blueprints, Jimmy, whatever you do. Now, those connections will all be in tomorrow. Good night, Doctor. See right. you in the morning. Good night. Good night. <laughs> see, that guy's got an awful pan, Doctor. There's a lot of them around. Well, I'll see you in the morning, Jimmy. <laughs> if I had a face like that, I'd have something done to it. <laughs> Good night, Doc. Good night. Telegram, please. Dr. Dave B. Parker of 42 Bank Street, New York City. Now, my idea is. Oh, Jimmy. My leave is long for a minute, please. Sit down, Jimmy. I want you to open an office. One of the best downtown buildings. I'm going to set you up as a consulting surgeon. From now on, you're known as the famous Dr. J.B. Parker. And I want you to do a little study on the side. 
I want you to familiarize yourself with plastic surgery. You know, there's no need of the both of us getting a lot of headaches. No fooling. I'm going to throw a lot of new words at you. Kiloplasty. Stammo. Well, that's enough. Stop. I want my fare back to New York. What you want is a little snifter. How about it? <sighs> well, how could I refuse on such an auspicious occasion? Certainly. Mr. Cornelius McCullough to see Dr. Brunton. Oh, yes, Miss McCullough, right away. I get this from Detroit. Oh. Yes? Mr. Cornelius McCullough to see you, Doctor. Oh, I'll be right out. Now, listen, J.B. Uh, who, who's this? The man I want to see. Now, I want you to play straight. Don't say anything. Just fix that up. Sit over there. <clears throat> Why, Mr. McCullough, how are you, sir? Come right in. I want you to know my friend, uh, Dr. J.B. Parker, Mr. Cornelius McCullough. How do you do, Doctor? How do you do, sir? Sit down, Mr. McCullough. I suppose you thought it was strange when you received a call from me. Well, not exactly. We get a lot of funny calls, and we have to take a lot of strange cases. No doubt, no doubt. But you see, I have an advantage over you. I know all about you, while you know nothing about me. But I can explain my plans to you in a very, very few words. Well, if it's in my line, I'll be glad to help, Doctor. Well, that's splendid. You know, Mr. McCullough, yours is the greatest detective agency west of New York. And as you are the greatest detective, I am the greatest plastic surgeon. Uh, <clears throat> you see, Mr. McCullough, the only difference between us is that your qualifications are known, while mine remain unknown. And that is where you come in. I want you to do the public a favor by making my name known. Sounds like a good-sized job, Doctor. Just how would you suggest my going about it? You must have some idea. Well, Mr. McCullough, just as there are ethics in your profession... Darn few. There are ethics in mine. You see, I can't get up on a soapbox and tell people who I am. In fact, I'm not permitted to advertise. I didn't want to go hire a press agent, use the old-fashioned method. That's where you come in. I want you to put at my disposal as many operatives as you can. Those who uh, know people of distinction, standing, people in the theater, people of wealth and position. And to those people, I want you to make known the name and reputation of Dr. Silas Brenton. I get you. At first, it sounded hard. There are a great many people, Mr. McCullough, in the world who would give everything they possess to fight off the ravages of, uh, well, let us be generous and call it middle age. For those people, I can work miracles. I can take 20 years from a woman of 50. I can remove battle scars from a pugilist. I can remove scars of former operations from men and women. For those that are able to pay, I can restore youth and beauty. I've read about that stuff. It started during the war. Exactly. Uh, yes, okay. yes. Well, how does it strike you? What do you think? I think we can manage it. Well, that's fine. When do you think you can get going? You see, my rent has started here. I'll start to work as soon as I get back to the office. Well, that's fine, Mr. McCullough. It's a pleasure to have you over. Thank you. Great glad to you, Doctor. I'll share the pleasure with you, Mr. McCullough. Well, by the way, I've been coming over to consult you professionally one Why, of these days. Why, is something wrong? There's growth here, back of my ear. Let's take a look at that right well, now. Much, but I think it'll be cut off. What do you think of that, Dr. Parker? Mm, simple end, Jamal. Veruca mm, Sandlitz. Think you can remove it? Any morning. Any morning you come over, it'll be a pleasure, Thanks. Mr. McCullough. Just stop in. It's a very simple matter. And about that other thing. Now. You'll hear from me just as soon as I get everything lined up. That's quite it. You're a million miles ahead of me, sir. Matter, don't you like the detective idea? Well, if it gets results, who am I to object? So by the way, where are you stopping? I'm not. My bags are at the station. Well, I'll have my secretary phone right away to the Drake Hotel. It doesn't have to be the Drake. Nothing is too good for Dr. John B. Parker. And tomorrow, I want you to go downtown and get a complete new outfit. Something in keeping with the dignity of your position. I have a few more things to show you that will gladden the heart of a physician. <laughs> well, say, uh, Si, did you hear that one about the girl who went down to pay her income tax? You mean the girl with the adhesive tape? Yes, yes. Well, listen, when I first heard that, it nearly threw me. I say. <laughs> Brenton, Ms. McCullough, say, did you ever hear of an actress named June Deering? Oh, yes. Yes, she's playing here in a show called The Spring Song. Yes, I saw it last season in New York. Well, one of my operatives, the best one, the Miss Snyder, has got her very much interested. Now, the show closes here in a week, and she can delay her departure for New York for the time necessary. Well, you can't promise her too much, McCullough. If she looks 60, I'll make her look 40. If she looks 40, I'll make her look 20. Okay, anytime you say. 
Well, it looks like we may expect our first patient very soon. Fine. Well, how do I look? Just what the well-dressed man would wear. Splendid. How about your office? I just came from there. It ought to be ready in a couple of days. And I've ordered my stationery. You know, I think we should celebrate this with a little snifter. Will you join me? Uh, splendid, Doctor. We're a scholar and a gentleman. I see. Why, Miss Fryer, just in time. Would you join two lonely men in a little libation? Why, certainly. Is it an auspicious occasion? Auspicious occasion? It's the day my laundry came back. I suppose this is to your success, Doctor. Our success, Doctor. Sure. But I've heard a great deal about you, Dr. Brenton. And I have the utmost confidence in you. Otherwise, I shouldn't be here. In a case such as yours, let me assure you I feel a personal and a public trust. You're a Nigel. Your position on the stage and the esteem in which you are held is such that I wouldn't like to promise anything that I wasn't certain that I could do. Well, that's very nice of you to say, Dr. Brenton. My caution, however, is a bit more personal. Oh, well, let me put you at ease. Before we go any further, I should like to have you consult a man whom I admire and esteem, Dr. J.B. Parker. Dr. Parker is very familiar with my work. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, my show, The Spring Song, closes next Saturday night. Well, I'd like one day of complete rest for you, so let us say Monday, Monday, at three. Fine, perfectly all right. Oh, and another thing, Dr. Breton. The question of publicity. But, Miss Deary, your desire for secrecy, privacy, and seclusion will be respected. We will enter you in our hospital under the name of... Uh, <clears throat> Miss Jones. Of course, I, um, I hadn't told you, but I'm a bit of an amateur artist. And while I've been sitting here, I, I took the liberty of uh, sketching you. Uh, oh, that's not I, Doctor. That's the way I looked years ago. That's the way you look when I get through with you. Well, I didn't know a physician had a sense of humor. Well, it isn't a sense of humor. It's a matter of vision and ability. Ah, yes. Well, you're looking splendidly, Miss Jane, and you're feeling better. Fine. Ah. Well, what do you think, Doctor? A remarkable piece of work, Doctor. My congratulations. Your mighty fortunes, Miss Deering. One of the neatest operations I've seen. <laughs> when will I be able to leave? Well, let me see. You've been here a week now. Uh, three or four days at the most. Don't you think so, Dr. Parker? Mm, well, I should recommend the adhesive be removed tomorrow, then a day or two of gentle massage, and Miss Deering should be able to go on her way. Right. I really think, Miss Deering, that you've responded remarkably to the operation. But there's only one thing I want to impress on your mind. You must remember what I told you. The important part of cases like this is the massage, the exercise. And if you follow the instructions I gave you, I'm sure that youth and beauty will be yours again. Well, rest assured, Doctor, I shall follow every detail implicitly. Now, uh, my fee, it's uh, $5,000, and the hospital charges are seven hundred and twenty. And there's also Dr. Parker's consultation fee, $3,500. Oh, yes. Shall I make out uh, two separate checks? No, just one. And that uh, for Dr. Parker. Well, I don't know what you mean, Doctor. Well, you see, Miss Deering, my work in this case has been a labor of love. And I do not feel that I can place any monetary value on my services. <laughs> well, after all, Doctor, you know you can't take artistry and professional pride to the bank. Well... Those are my sentiments, Miss Deering, and of course I realize that I can't profit in any way by publicity in this case. Exactly. So you should accept payment. Well, you send me an autographed picture sometime and I shall feel amply repaid. <laughs> and I don't know what to say, Doctor. Well, words are rather meaningless, Doctor, to express my appreciation in a case like that. But when you give that to Dr. Parker, tell him that with it goes my love. Lucky Parker. <laughs> now, Miss Deering, do you have a veil there, I believe? Yes. Uh, yes my car's waiting for you at the side door. No one will see you go out. And if you just put that over your face, I'll give you over the hands of the nurse here. Mm -hmm. uh, the nurse, Miss Sanders, will take care of you. Goodbye, Miss Deering. Goodbye. And thank you, Dr. Breton. Thank you. Deposit this check in account number two and get Mr. McCullough on the phone for me. Mr. McCullough, just a minute. 
Hello, McCullough. This is Brenton. How well do you stay with the papers of publicity? You do, eh? Well, I have a little statement that I want you to put in the paper for me. I'll get it in your hands sometime today. But I don't want it to break until tomorrow. Fine. Come on. I pay my hand, read all about it. June Theory, good by Chicago surgeon. Georgia. What? Did you read the papers today? No, why? June Deering sued by plastic surgeon for facelift. Why, Georgia, I wouldn't have told it to you if I'd known it was going to upset you. It didn't upset me. Holograms for you, Doctor. Oh, thank you, Jimmy. A mighty good looking couple. Betcha. That ball headed guy at the next table there is Al Feinberg, the lawyer. I don't know him. You will. Can't read papers in this town long without knowing him. Divorce lawyer, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Gets his picture in the papers about three times a day. Five times on Sunday. <laughs> the two girls with him are the nation sister. You've seen them. buffoonery for tonight. I have some big surprises for you. Before we start out with our regular floor show, I should introduce a number of celebrities that are with us here this evening. And over at this table, not far, is a famous cowboy star of the cinema. Now, he hasn't his horse with him, but I wonder if we can have Mr. Ken Maynard take the ball. Ah, but wait a minute, folks. Over at another table, we have a celebrated sister team. The latest sensation in musical comedy. And our folks, I think with just a little inducement, we can get these two clever girls to come out here and do one of their famous numbers. Introducing Lottie and Dottie Nation. escape those two sisters, where to? Home. Your home or my home? Mine, of course. Well, why not my home? Because your home's not my home. We can't continue the party at your home. Hardly. Well, why not make my home your home? To continue the party? In a way, yes. Oh, honey. Uh, what? Come on. No, I don't want Hold any more. It's four o'clock. I want to go home. That's a good no. idea. And now, Harold, you take care of the girls, will you? Oh, no. Oh, no. Going home? <laughs> yes, Please. we're going home. Let's go. I'm going to take this. Well, you're going to stay the way? Yeah. Good. <laughs> what are you 
which way? You take that one. I'll get this other guy. All right. Pipe down, sister. I'll do all the talking. Oh. <laughs> Want a drink? Hey, what's your name? Oh, he wants to know who we are. Well, our names are plastered all over this town. Yeah, yes. plastered is right. But oh. what's the name? Oh, go oh. pay your papers. Five o'clock. Go when it go home. Sure. What's your name, sister? Say, you dumb maid. I'll tell you what my name oh. is. Oh. Get oh, down. Oh, oh. you're jumping on my oh. sister, you big dog. Sing. I want to go home. Yes, sir. I think it's high time now. Yeah. Will you come oh, out of the car? Come on, I want to go home. Oh, shut up. Oh. What's going on here? Oh, no. What's the matter, Frank? Oh, that, that come on. That little alley cat there cracked oh. me over the head with a bone. Oh, I did oh she not. did, eh? No, well, you're all under arrest. Can you make it, Frank? I want to go home. Oh, I'm taking you first to town. Come on, get going. Oh, we're not going. Office. Uh, uh, give me uh, state four one nine two. No, oh, thank you, sir. No, sir. Yeah, put it right there, sir. Hello, McCullough. This is Brenton speaking. Well, I see your girlfriends that you uh, pointed out to me last night got in some trouble. Yeah, you read the morning paper. Do you know where they're stopping? Well, I'd like you to arrange so I can meet them. Oh, you can, eh? Who? Oh, their lawyer, Feinberg. I... Well, I have a great idea, and I'll... I'll meet you in the lobby of their hotel in about an hour. Okay. This is Dr. Silas Brenton, oh. Dr. J.B. Parker. Oh, hi, Doc. Oh, uh, Mr. Al Feinberg. Dr. Brenton. I've heard, heard of you. Dr. Parker. How do you do that? Have a little drink, Chief? No, thanks. Say, you, come here. I, yeah. I want to have work for you. Yeah, sure. Well, now, what is it you've got to I say? I don't want anybody to hear. Come here. If you're the facelifter, you better go see that cop, because he needs some new parts to his face. Oh. I got one of his ears in my pocketbook. I'm going to use it for chewing gum. <laughs> <laughs> 
These girls spoken to anyone? Not a soul. Good. We told them we were taking a bath. Left. You better pipe down if you want to get out of this jam. Well, well, can't can't be it. Super can't get in, Wait a minute. Let me try. Office. No, she beat the policeman hey, up. Hey, let us in just for a minute, will you, Miss Nason? Oh, come on, Miss Nason. Hey, come on. You know who that guy was, don't you? No, who is it? Earl Wyman, producer of the Nation Sister show. But he's ready to tear his hair out. Such troubles. Hmm? Take us off. Well, you I... girls get right in bed. In bed? Yes, yes, come on. Oh, why? Feinberg, Feinberg here. You stand up there. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Wyman, never yeah. mind him. Yeah. Come here. Yeah. Come here. Yeah. Now, quiet. Get out. Let's go over here. Now, Con, you go get that those newspaper men in. But so all this? Never mind. I'll explain to you in a moment. We'll come in. Now, look. We'll cover them up. So, now, what I want you to do is... About time, you What's going on? It's a crime, Doctor. A crime. Oh, hell. Look, get it. Get it. All right, hit it, Harry. Well, Miss Marlman, I thought you told me that the policeman was smashed out the front. Yeah, I don't know. This is the funniest thing I've ever heard. Gentlemen, 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 I am Dr. Silas Britton. I was called in to attend these two young ladies, and I find that they've been brutally beaten by these policemen. This is my friend, Dr. J.B. Parker. Now, boys, don't, don't tire these young ladies by too much questioning. And if you want to get in touch with me, you'll find me at my office, Dr. Silas Breton. Good day, gentlemen. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, Doc. Well, let's see if we get... There, we got a story here. You should be happy you made the papers again. Is that all? What would you like? Well, do I have to tell you? Have you got a little kiss that isn't working? Mm-hmm. Anything else, sir? Oh, that's all right now. Tired, dear? Hard day, wasn't it? They're all hard days. You know, I've been thinking about a radio broadcast. I can't see why a plastic surgery hour wouldn't go. With you at the microphone, anything would go. You're such a help, Elsa. You know, sometimes I think that, well, everything uh, that we are, I owe to you, little Elsie Fryer. What's this we are? You're thinking of incorporating? No, but seriously. I think it'd be a great idea, radio broadcast. I'm going to call Feinberg in the morning and tell him that I could be persuaded to do it and combine that with a daily article in the paper, you know? Uh, the Art of the Care of the Face, Plastic Surgery by Dr. Silas Brent. Si, you're marvelous. If you ever need any references, call on me. Oh, I wish you'd stop fussing around. Come here to me. You want me to really appreciate what a great guy you are? Certainly. Outside of your art, of course. Exactly. Well, you'd better get me out of that office of yours. To be a man's secretary and still think of him as a hero is a pretty tough job. You really think so? I'm afraid so. You are, huh? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like a pretty good proposition to me. The Aphrodite Face Cream Hour with Dr. Silas Brenton. It should be a sensation. And remember, we're on a national hookup now, and our network is second to none. And the Department of Commerce has estimated that we are the most powerful radio factor in the United States. Of course, it would be ridiculous to tell you what an advertising medium it is. What do you think, Dr. Parker? Well, I may be a little old-fashioned, but it seems a bit unethical to me. Mm. Mm. That's the one thing made me hesitate accepting your proposition. Why, Doctor, the hour would be conducted in the most dignified manner possible. There wouldn't be the slightest thought of advertising in it, as far as your profession is concerned. You would merely be giving the women of the country the benefit of your expert advice. A sort of free consultation, in other words. Well, I hadn't quite looked at it in that light. What uh, sort of a program would you want me to give? Well, that's up to you. Well, suppose I were to lecture on aesthetics in its relation to plastic surgery. Something like this. Um, aesthetics is the science of the beautiful, the sublime. Something we took from the Greeks. 
It was not until the noblest period of art in Greece had passed its zenith that any serious attempt was made to ascertain the nature of the beauty which art represents. In the study of aesthetics, we learn that appreciation of beauty is synonymous with its expression. Plastic surgery is putting it in practice. Very, very satisfactory in some cases. But in my experience, I've found the elastic to be far superior, especially in... ...desirable as art in any of its other forms. And I, Dr. Here's our friend again. Oh, turn that faker off. No, 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 no. I, I want to hear this fellow. Plastic surgery. He's worth so, listening to. Who are not vested with facial beauty will not be forced to walk through life without the... And I think he's a member of our profession. The worst of it is we can't do anything about it. Mrs. Jonathan P. Day. 423 Fullerton Parkway. Yes, I will. <laughs> More fan mail. I feel like Crosby, Colombo, and Valley. It's all right if it doesn't get you into trouble. Uh, uh, yes. I thought this might interest you. And who is Mrs. Jonathan P. Day? Her husband's president of four or five banks, a prominent clubman, comes from one of the oldest families in town. You read about Mrs. Day's automobile accident in the papers. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, they called him, wanted to know if you'd see her. So I made an appointment for you for 7.30 this evening. Shall I confirm it? Why, of course. Go so quiet. There's a break. The day's one of the 400. Oh, better be careful, Si. We may be stepping out of our class. Don't be silly. We're just getting into our class. Looks like a break to me. Well, not to me. As to this general condition, I will wager to be up and about oh, in a month. Florence. Dr. Breton, this is my daughter, Florence. Oh, I'm delighted to know you. Miss How do you do? Delighted to Florence and I sent for your doctor. Really? I'll get you cool for you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Breton, what we're really interested in is whether or not Mother will be disfigured. Well, time alone can tell. But there is hope. Well, when I say time alone can tell, I mean that the scars, oh, that's a simple skin graft. But the injury to the nerve causing the drooping of the eye, that's something else again. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Brenton, our family physician was just as positive as you were about the skin graft. Yes? But you are no more definite about the eye than he was. Yes, you see, Doctor, that's what worried us. Well, you mustn't. Let me assure you, Mr. Day, that in less than six months, your wife's eye will appear as it did before the accident. Thank you, Doctor. I've placed my wife in your hand. That's a great honor, Mr. Day. Thank you very much. Good night, Doctor. Good night, Mr. Day. Good night, uh, Good, Good night, night, Doctor. Good night. Now, you see, Dad, I told you I believed in Dr. Brenton, and he's going to do Mother a lot of good. I and besides that, that, he's perfectly charming. Come on, let's go. All right, dear. Let's do that. But Mother doesn't seem to make any progress, Dr. Brenton. And it worries me. But, Miss Day, if your mother had come to the hospital here originally, I could have given her so much more of my personal attention. But it really hasn't turned out so badly. Since I have to call at your house every day, I see so much more of you. Oh, Dr. Branton. I have a little surprise for you. Stand over there. Why, it's a mother. That is as your mother's going to look when I get through with her. It will be marvelous, Dr. Brandon, if only you can. I'm sure I can. I couldn't fail. You say the most encouraging things. Was that unusual for a doctor? Mother will be so thrilled. Are you going to let Father see it? Why, of course. It'll do so much for him. Raise his spirits. You see, he's feeling rather low. Oh, I understand, but don't you worry about that. I'm feeling rather low myself. No. And I have an idea that you could raise my spirits. How? Are you doing anything right now? No. Well, what do you say we go to luncheon? I'd love it. You would? Come on. And now that I've found you, I'm not going to let you go. In fact, I'm going to rush you. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really should call you Florence for that. I call you Dr. Branton. But secretly, I think of you as Cy. You do? Mm -hmm. Well, I should kiss you for that. Oh, Cy, not here. <laughs> Captain, would you uh, spread that napkin for me right there? Like this? Uh, yes, just like that. Yes, sir. There. Thank you so much. 
course, that was getting away with murder. There is no question in my mind, Mrs. Stoughton, that I can do for you what I've done for many others. Yes, I know, Doctor, but it worries me. I understand. But before I take the case, I'd like to have Dr. Parker look at you. Just one minute. Uh, Dr. Parker, if you're not busy. Yes, Doctor, uh, I'd like to have you meet uh, Mrs. Stilton, uh, my friend, Dr. Parker. Mrs. Stilton? How do you do, Dr. Parker? How do you do? Well, Doctor? <clears throat> Ah, yes. Very interesting, Doctor. There are a good many things we can do for Mrs. Stilton. Most any. Mm. The appointment is for 11.30, Tuesday morning, Mrs. Stilton. Goodbye, Dr. Parker. Mrs. Stilton. This way. Until Tuesday. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye, Mrs. Stilton. The next time you pull one of those, I'd like to have a little warning. <clears throat> Come in. Mr. McCullough here to see you. Oh, send her right in. Come in, Con. How are you? Hello, Doc. You know Miss Snyder, one of my operatives, don't you, Doc? I've never had the pleasure. How do you do, Miss Snyder? How do you do? Snyder, Dr. Parker, Miss Snyder. Miss Snyder? You do, You're the young lady who contacted Miss Deering for me, aren't you? Yes. I've never had a chance to thank you. Sit down. Well, what's on your mind, Con? Say, Doc, can you straighten bow legs? Wrong case, Doc. Mine are all right. My error? Well, what is it, Con? Oh, uh, Miss Snyder has a bow-legged case for you, if you can handle it. You mustn't say bow-legs, Con. It's very unethical, isn't it, Dr. Parker? Mm. You must say leg-straightening case. Okay. Well, Miss Snyder has a leg-straightening case for you, if you can handle it. Well, how much is there in it? Well, it's a funny case, and that's why I came over. There isn't much money in it, but she will pay 5000 It's all she has. Well, that's all she has. That's all we can get. Who is she? She's a Mrs. Finn. She lost her husband and collected the insurance on him, and now she wants to get married again. So I think she'll be willing to shoot the bankroll. Well, that sounds all right. Send her on Monday. See what we can do. Okay. Now, let's be going. Come on, Miss Snyder. Well, that looks rosy. We're going too far, Si. Straightening legs is not as simple as facelift. Nonsense. You said the same thing about Mrs. Day's eye. Which you're not through with yet. You're getting feeble, J.B. What you need is a little drink to brace you up. And remember, there's nothing that Dr. Brenton can't do. Telegram for you, Doctor. Oh, thank you, Jerry. Kid, what are you going to do? What I've always done? Nothing. Well, looks like trouble to me. Where are you going? Oh, uh, I'll be back in a minute. A Mrs. Finn is coming in on Monday. Make it 7.30 in the evening. Put her in room four. She's a McCullough patient, so let her know through him. Si. Hmm? What's the matter? What do you mean? Oh, I don't know. You just don't seem the same. We haven't been out together for ages. Well, I've been very busy lately. You're busy tonight, too? Well, until after midnight. Oh. Oh, what's the matter? Oh, nothing, except I think you've been trying to avoid me lately. Well, no, I wouldn't do that intentionally, sweetheart. Why don't you come up to the apartment tonight, and I'll get home as soon as I can. I must look in on Mrs. Day. I think you've been looking in on the entire day family too much lately. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, sweetheart. What do you think? I don't like Dr. Breton's methods at all, John. Uh, radio, newspapers, cold cream, advertising, ah, shucks. You old medical bogeys have too many ethics. Well, I'm not gonna argue that with you. 
But then, uh, no, I won't put it on. I don't understand his treatment at all. I want Dr. Kelly to see her. Kelly? Who's Dr. Kelly? Dr. Kelly is our foremost plastic surgeon. And I'm worried about that eye. By all means, have Dr. Kelly see her. Well, he'll be back from Toronto Tuesday. All right, bring him up, will you? I will. Good night. Good night. I really can't tonight. No. No, Ted, I didn't promise you. Yes. All right, call me tomorrow. Well, dear, it looks like you're expecting company. Oh, Dr. Benton is coming, that's all. At least he said he would. You're not becoming interested in Brenton, are you? No, but he's attending Mother, and I think we ought to be nice to him, see? But Florence, you must know that I love you. And I want you to be my wife. I, I don't know what to say. But I, there comes a day in every man's life when... You know, Elsie, dear, there comes a night in every man's life. Oh, but I understand you so well, sir. Yes, and I understand you too, dear. I understand you too, sweetheart. All ready for you now in a few minutes, Mrs. Fitt. Miss Collins is coming down and she'll make you comfortable. Doctor. Are you sure it will be quite all right? Of course. But, Doctor, I feel that I should tell you that I've consulted a number of well-known surgeons, and none of them have advised an operation. My dear Mrs. Flynn, you can put yourself in my hands with perfect confidence. I wouldn't take your case unless I was sure of the result. Miss Collins, this is Mrs. Finn. How do you do, Mrs. Finn? Now, don't worry. It'll all be over in a minute. You're sure? Quite sure? Quite sure. Quite sure. When Dr. McDonald attended her, her face, except for several rather unsightly scars, was in perfect condition. Now you know what we found. There's only one deduction to make. And this was caused by Dr. Breton. Yes. yes. What shall we do? I shall call a meeting of the Medical Society tomorrow. We'll proceed against Dr. Brenton and make a thorough investigation. But Mrs. Day... Well, now, don't worry. We'll, of course, do everything in our power to undo the harm the charlatan has caused. Doctor, you said... Are you sure, Dr. Kelly? As sure as I can be. It's my honest and professional opinion that the left side of Mrs. Day's face will remain paralyzed. Oh! oh. Oh, my dear. Oh, Florence, 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 He's taken too many chances. He's changed a bit. Harder to handle. I want you to have a talk with him, Georgie, but, uh, you know, go easy. Is there any truth in this? I don't know. He's too fast for me. I can't keep up with them anymore. And, uh, so you have no objection to our committee making a complete investigation? Not at all. You might learn something. Perhaps. Would you like to go through the rest of the establishment now that you're here? I have nothing to hide from the medical association or anyone else. Thank you. No. I'd rather have the rest of the committee here when I go through. As you like. Any particular time, Doctor? Any time. This afternoon? It's all right. Good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon, Doctor. Dr. Parker, 
Dr. Brenton's been looking for you. Yes, I know. Is he alone? Yes. All right, Ed. Good luck. Sorry. Georgia. Yes, it's me. Well, I, I'm, so, I'm so glad to see you. I, 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 I sit down. I, I, you, uh, well, you're looking splendidly. Um, you look pretty good yourself. Yes, well, how, how, how's New York? How, how's everybody there? What's this about you, you and that day girl? The day, why, uh, why, that, that's just something to advance my business, that's all. What business? Well, I know, but why talk about that now? You're just a writer. Take off. When take did you off earn the right I... to put plastic surgeon after your name? You don't know anything about plastic surgery. How do you know I don't? There's nothing more to it than any intelligent surgeon can do. Oh, no. Oh, Cy, what's happened to you? I found out the truth about your discharge from Bronx General. I know all about it. You're not fooling anybody. June Deering, the nation sister. Oh, I read the papers, and I can read between the lines, too. All I can give you credit for is a lot of nerve. Well, nerve is half the battle. But why argue about but that? But you're playing now? with fire, Cy. I'm no prophet, but they'll put you in jail for malpractice and throw away the key. How do you get away with it? But I don't promise them anything. I tell all my patients they can't expect any improvement under six months. I'm still in the time limit of my first operation. Then what? Then what? Now, you ask me what. With the money I'll make here, and you, and boats leaving New York every hour, and you ask me what? You've sunk pretty low, haven't you, Si? There's nothing too contemptible, is there? Who are you to sit in judgment on me? Who asked you to come here anyway? Do I owe you anything? <clears throat> you filthy beast. I suppose you brought her. Yes, I did. I brought her because yes, I... Yes, you're because. Well, you picked a fine time. You know what's happened? Kelly, the medical association, is here. They're going to start an investigation. Well, none of which surprises me. Well, if I'm in your in, too... Well, in that case, then, this is no time for that kind of drinking. Oh, uh, how is that leg straightening case? Not so good, doctor. That's why I came down, Dr. Brenton. She's running the temperature. Yeah, well, I'll take a look. Well, never mind. I'll take a look at her myself. All right. Mrs. Finn's running a temperature of 103. Well, what of it? Don't bother me about okay. it. I'm all right. Wait a minute. We'd better get Brenton out of here. He's pretty drunk. Call his car, will you? Oh, Jimmy, how's Mrs. Finn? Not so good. Uh, get Dr. Brenton's car right away. Yes. Well, why do you want to tell me? Hmm? Yeah, go away a minute, please. Sorry, well, something's happened. Well, what of it? Listen, Sai, after you left the hospital this afternoon, Kelly came back. He brought his entire staff. They're getting out a warrant for your arrest, and the charge is criminal negligence. Well, that's that. Well, what are you going to do? Migrate? Yeah. You and me? Will you go with me? Where? I'm going to sign two checks, one on each account. You take them to the day and night bank, cash them. When you get through there, go to the office, pick up any books and balances, anything you can find. I'll get the tickets, and we'll catch the Creole Limited for New Orleans. Well, what are you going to do in New Orleans? It's a seaport, isn't it? Get away from there just the same as you could in New York. You'll find a boat and take it wherever it's going. What about the day girl? Well, you ought to know better than that. She was just a good front. I don't believe you, but it's okay. You go get the money, as I told you. I'll pack. In the meantime, I'll send and get the tickets. 
then I'll phone you either at your house or the office and tell you what time that train leaves. But if anything happens, remember, it's the Creole Limited, and I'll meet you at the station. Oh, well, how about Jimmy and the nurses? When you get there, pay them off, but don't say anything to anyone. Sookie. Sookie. Make some black coffee and get those bags out. Yes. We're packing. Say, where have you been? Oh, where's everyone? Upstairs. Say, what's going on around here anyway? Nothing. Nothing? It's the busiest nothing I ever saw. Where's Dr. Breton? I don't know. Listen, uh, Jimmy, you stay here, and if anyone asks for Dr. Breton, say you expect him back shortly. Where are you going? Out. What is all this, sir? I don't know, and I don't care. It looks bad. I Very bad. Well, sir. Well, what are your plans? Hello, Al. Oh, hello, Carl. Well, hello. it looks like old home week. Oh, you're still kidding, eh? Well, you're in a mess. What's the answer? It's like you've got a little legal work cut out for you. Not for me. So you're deserting the ship, eh? Oh, look here, sir. Why didn't you tell us you didn't know anything about plastic surgery? Well, yeah. why should I? We could have gone about it in a different way. It's too late now, and you're not going to drag my name into or it. Or mine. So you're both turning me down, eh? Hey, listen. You're in a tough spot. You're going to get yourself out of it just as you got yourself into it. Come on. Goes please. for me, too. Then what happened? I don't know. All I heard was that Kelly was getting out a warrant for Breton. It looks as though we're all washed up. Oh, but there must be something we can do, J.B. We can't lay down now. Now's when he needs us. Oh, too late. Where are you going? I'm going back to Cy. Well, it was good while it lasted. Is Dr. Brenton in? Uh, he'll be back shortly. I think I'll get something to eat. Hello, is this you, Elsie? Yes. Well, listen, I checked up on the train and everything, and it leaves at 9.30. Yeah, Creole Limited. Yes. What's the matter? Can't you talk? I, I called you the apartment, but I couldn't get you. Now pack and uh, just bring what you need. And I'll, I'll meet you at the station at 9.30. All right. It's okay. Bring me a drink in there, will you? Dr. Silas Brenton, he's taking the Creole Limited tonight. My name, what difference does that make? Oh, thank you, Sookie. Hello, hello, Superior 247A. Hello, Dr. Brenton's apartment, please. I'll wire you where I am. I'll oh, get those dark glasses of mine, will you? Hello? I must talk to Dr. Brenton. It's important. Well, Dr. Brenton, he's not here right now. Well, you must try to catch him. Hurry. Well, Dr. Brenton just went down the elevator. Oh. Take those bags down to the cab. Well, I made it. Yeah, I, I know you don't. Say, what was the matter with you when I talked to you at the office today? When you talked to me? When I called you at the office and told you to meet me in the train, what was the matter with you? Well, you never talked to me. What do you mean I never talked to you? Well, you didn't.
I've got time to make them. Open that gate, please. I want to get that man. Come along with me. Just a minute, Dr. Brenton. Sorry, sorry. Let me explain. I wanted to tell you. I can't now, begin. Now, don't. Please. Come on, Doctor. All right. Just a minute, young lady. Sorry. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've heard both expert and lay testimony as to just what kind of a man Dr. Silas Brenton is. You've heard from former associates and patients the methods he employed. In no uncertain terms has he been described as a quack and charlatan of the first water. You've heard women expose very private details, details which concern Dr. Brenton. You've heard of the exorbitant fees he charged, tributes that he has levied. He came to our city under a cloud, a very serious cloud. Our investigation of Dr. Brenton has revealed that not only was he discharged from the Bronx General Hospital for unethical conduct, but that he has had the temerity to set himself up in our midst as a specialist in a specialty he knows nothing about. He's no more plastic surgeon than you or I. There's no need of my going over all the testimonies. A witness who was on the stand and who had to be excused because of her inability to control herself while giving testimony is now ready to resume the stand. She was the last of the witnesses for the state. And among the victims of Dr. Silas Brenton stands out as a martyr. She has suffered as no other one of his many patients has suffered. She is a martyr, a living martyr, to her credulity and belief that Dr. Brenton could rectify one of nature's distortions. I'm going to recall, with the court's permission, Mrs. Finn. Bring in Mrs. Finn. Be necessary, Your Honor, to have the witness sworn in again? No. Proceed. Mrs. Finn has told you most of the facts. You know the entire story of how she came to Dr. Brenton's office and the sales talk he delivered. You've heard in great detail of how she was removed from his hospital at the point of death. The highly respected members of the Medical Association have testified as to their finding. Now, I want you to see the results of Dr. Brenton's operation on Mrs. Finn. Mrs. Finn, I'm going to ask you to please remove your blanket. No, no. Oh. 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 Order in the car. Order in the car. <laughs> Mrs. Finn's legs have been amputated. You have seen for yourselves. They had to be amputated. It was done on the advice of specialists in order to save her life. Another hour and she might not have been with us. And the charge against the defendant would then have been murder. I charge this situation directly to the willful and criminal negligence of Dr. Cyrus Brenton. And I say that if the torture and cruelty visited upon Mrs. Finn goes unpunished, it will remain a blemish and a blot on the entire medical profession all over the world. State rest. What do you think of that guy, Brenton, trying his own case? Say, he's got so much ego that if they hang him, he'll try to pull the rope. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, 
There's no need of my cross-examining the witness. Even if I wanted to cross-examine her, I couldn't pass through the ordeal. I stand with bowed head before a God who has seen fit to make this poor woman a sacrificial lamb to the conniving methods of organized medical practitioners. I refuse to examine any witness in this case. I shall appeal solely to your intelligence and understanding. The most persistent charge against me, ladies and gentlemen, is that I have violated the ethics of the medical profession. And what does that mean? Merely that I have refused to abide by laws and bylaws laid down by a set of antiquated medical men whose methods are being quickly dispelled by modern sense and research. In the case of this unfortunate woman, I am accused of being the cause of the loss of her limbs. For the rest of her life, she must be confined to her chair. Never again will she know the pleasure of walking. For the rest of her days, she will be handicapped. And why, ladies and gentlemen, why, I ask you, why? Because she was made the victim by my enemies, your enemies, the enemies of society, the self-appointed authorities who sit in judgment on matters alien even to them. This hypocritical and selfish group of medical men took matters into their own hands. And what was the result? You saw it? Ladies and gentlemen, there was no need for amputation in Mrs. Finn's case. That is a dire statement to make now, because it is too late to make amends. But not one medical man who appeared as a witness in this courtroom knows one thing of my life study, plastic surgery. Dr. Kelly claims he does but it is something of which he has vaguely heard. And because he knows nothing of this subtle art, his ignorance and his prejudice are one. I was unknown to this group of organized physicians. I came into their midst and entered into practice illegally, they say. Automatically, I became a competitor. And they came in like thieves in the night. They searched the premises and found nothing to find fault with. But they saw this poor patient lying on her back, recovering from my successful attempt to undo some of nature's faults. And what did they do? They consulted no one, not even this poor woman who was unconscious, who could make no protest in favor of the men she trusted. They kidnapped her. They worked like felons. Did they inform the papers of their intentions? No. Did they consult me? No. But they put their thermometers in her mouth. And after a hurried glance, they laid hands eager to find fault on her pulse. And the verdict was a verdict rendered long before they saw the patient. They came to trap me by any means. Evidence has been given by my friends as to prices I have levied, tributes that have been paid. Have they told of the numerous successful operations I have performed free of charge for those poor unfortunates who could not afford to pay? No, they have not. These men who call me an imposter, a charlatan, a criminal, have they proven that there is any set price for what I do? Ladies and gentlemen, you must believe me. I have done no wrong. And I prove it by standing here alone. I have no lawyers, no organization to back me up, because I do not need it. Because I know in my heart I am innocent. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Finn has suffered, but not at the hands of Silas Brenton, but at the hands of his persecutors and his prosecutors. I only wish I had the power, the greater skill, the aid of divine help to repair all the hurt done her, to restore her to complete 
health again. But no man can do that now. It is too late. I throw myself on your mercy. Sire, so hey, Doc, that was grand. You touched me, Sire. Thank you, uh, J.B. Don't you worry at all, Mrs. Bailey. We can depend on that joy. Will the foreman please read the verdict? I warn the courtroom not to enter into any demonstration whatsoever. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. Mrs. Finn, you know how I feel about all this. If there's anything I can do to help you, you have only to ask me. Yes, Dr. Brenton. You can give me back my legs. Give me back my legs, I say. <laughs> Come on, we'll make that last edition. Oh. 